Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to see if I can do two things at once. Um, I'm really honored to, to be invited to join you on this, on this evening. I want to start by saying congratulations. Um, I'm sure this is a really exciting moment for you, for your families, whether it's um, you know, second or third time outside the country or your first time outside the country. It's an exciting opportunity. Um, so I'm here to share what I know. I'm also hoping to learn a little bit from you. My son is a junior at Drew University and is headed to Greece, but just for a few weeks um, in January. So I know there's some people getting ready for a trip to Greece also. So I'm here to share what I know, but also to learn a, bit, a little bit also. Um, let me see if I'm, so I want to start with what my plan is. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Hauser mentioned, a lot of the work that I do at the Eagleton Institute of Politics is about equipping, encouraging our students to engage in discussion political discussion, talking across difference. So I want to take a, a few moments to share why I think that matters and how I approach this work. And then I want to share with you, you know, some of the practices, some of the tools, tips, themes that come up in conversations in our classrooms um, might also be applicable and you think will be applicable for all of you as you're getting ready to go to a different country, be in a different context. As, as Dr. Hauser mentioned, you know, we are preparing for a consequential election in the United States in two weeks. Um, and, and we still may not know the, the outcome of that election for weeks and weeks after the election. So I would expect that American politics will come up um, when you are abroad. Um, so to give you, a, a, you know, some pointers, perhaps, or some things to keep in mind as you're going into a new context. Um, I'll have an activity for us to participate in together and then to reflect upon it. Um, there'll be some opportunities that we'll be you know, seeking your, your input along the way, so if you could get those thinking caps on. Um, I want to start, I'm a political scientist, as Dr. Hauser mentioned, and I spend a lot of time in particular thinking about um, democracy, the health of democracy, how we teach democratic citizenship in the United States, um, and although there's so much focus right now on the campaign and vitriol and political polarization, um, one thing I always like to start these conversations with is a discussion about what politics is at its root um, or what democratic systems, such as the United States, um, what they really are in essence, what they're all about. And I'd like to sort of pose the idea at the outset that in many ways, Politics is really about relationships. It's the way in which we relate to one another, the relationships that we build with each other, the relationships we build as a community, and then the democracies that are rooted in those communities. So I, I think it's always worth thinking, are there any political scientists in the Okay, so we've got a few. Are you the only one? Wow, we gotta get more political science majors out there. Uh, see, okay, good. Oh, no, I'm proud of being a political scientist. So I feel I have some sort of duty to quote Aristotle at the very beginning because he was the first political scientist. But he you know, posits this idea that democracies or governments are really an extension of communities. And to quote Aristotle from, from his, his you know, classic politics, he writes, every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view to some good. For everyone acts in order to obtain that which they think is good, the state or the political community, which is the highest of all, and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good. So the study of politics is often, how, what is the greatest good, and how do we achieve that in a democracy, in some sort of form of government? But again, I would challenge you at the beginning to think about politics is about relationships and the way we relate to each other and the communities in which we live. So not only here in the United States, but now you're going to be exposed to a global community. So what does that mean when you're thinking about interacting with people from other countries? And what I would say is, you know, often, too often I think, we think of these as two separate and distinct entities, a community and a democracy. Um, I would say they are interwoven. The health of a community enables a healthy democracy, and a healthy democracy is a reflection of community. So, not only I encourage you to start with that, 
Um, and for those of you who have ever been to the Eagleton Institute of Politics, um, you know, we really see conversation, political, engaging in dialogue as a fundamental skill of being a lowercase d democratic citizen. We focus a lot, I know, and I'm guilty of it myself, focus a lot on things like voting and advocacy and volunteering and public service, all really, really important. But what I would say is our ability to talk to each other, especially about things that are difficult, um, is also a really fundamental skill if we're going to learn how to get along, if we're going to build a healthy community that will ultimately lead to a healthy democracy. So we do a lot of work at Eagleton on teaching the skills, not only you know, why we think talking politics is important or our ability to engage in dialogue across difference is important, but how you do it, ways in which you approach these kinds of difficult conversations. So I want to share a little bit about three in particular practices or um, approaches that we recommend to students when talking politics here in, in our classrooms. But then I want to challenge all of you, challenge us together to think about how you might apply that as you are preparing to go to another country and to live in another community. Um, again, especially weeks after a political election here in the United States. So the first one I want to share is this idea of what's your intention when you go into a conversation. So, you know, if you ever come to Eagleton and, and sit in a class, you know, we often do things called Socratic circles. Um, probably you did, you've done those either in your classrooms now or you did it in high school where you sit in a literal circle and, and take a, you know, tackle a prompt, ta tackle an idea. Um, one of the first um, practices we engage in is to have students think about what's their intention when going into a conversation. What's your intention when going into a political conversation? Um, often, students will go into political conversations with the hopes of convincing the person they're speaking to that their argument is the correct argument, or kind of winning the argument. One idea we suggest at the beginning is this idea of going into a conversation with the spirit of inquiry, with the spirit of curiosity, not necessarily going into a situation because you want to convince someone that your point of view is the right one, but that you want to just learn uh, after a conversation with someone who disagrees with you. So not necessarily trying to convince someone, but going into the spirit of inquiry, with the spirit of curiosity. I would encourage all of you who are getting ready, starting to shop and pack your bags and get ready to go abroad in January, what might that look like? How might that translate as you're getting ready to go into another community? Especially in the weeks after an election. I'll ask for volunteers, and if not, I'll just walk around and put a microphone in front of you. <laughs> what might that look like if you're going abroad? Going into a new context, going in with the spirit of inquiry, the spirit of curiosity. How might that apply as you're going into a new country? Where are you headed? Rome. Rome. Um, I guess just like figuring out how other people live in a different culture, you're not adapting instead of being like, oh, my way will live is that right life, right? Getting a better sense of how they live, what culture is like in this new community, going to Rome. I was in Rome two years ago, it was fantastic. Yes. Sure. Yeah, 
I think just doing some research now, so you're getting ready, you know, we're, you're going to be coming from a country that has a representative form of government, representative form of democracy. Um, what sort of system of government does the country you're going into have? So at least having that understanding. Um, we will just elect the president, fingers crossed. Um, what sort of system of government do they have there? Is it a prime minister? Is it a president? What sort of power or responsibility does that person have? So, and sense of humility. Even just little things, which you probably already know, don't assume everyone speaks English. <laughs> so certainly going in and knowing how to order coffee in that language. Little things like that go a long way. Um, this sort of was alluded to earlier, but I would encourage you to think too, when we're talking to students about going into difficult conversations, we encourage them to approach conversations with a willingness to look at things from a different perspective. Um, perspective taking. Um, thinking a little bit too, um, you know, how might the lived experience of people living in Rome, in Greece, in London, how might that be affecting their worldview? Um, and to not assume, certainly, that it's the same um, as yours, or as the same as you would find in the United States. So for example, um, here in the United States, we, as I said, you'll be, we'll be a few weeks, months out from an election. There's a lot of conversation in the United States right now about democracy and the health of democracy. When, when you look at poll numbers um, about top issues that are on people's minds as they're going to the polls, a lot of Americans are talking about the health of democracies. Anyone know? Is this a conversation that's just taking place in the United States? No. What are some ways in which this is a conversation that's taking place in other countries or other democracies? Anyone know? Who's going to Italy? The other people who are going to Italy? Does anyone know who the newly elected prime minister is in Italy? <laughs> what? Her political bent is? Yeah. Maloney. Yeah. What do we know about Maloney? Prime Minister Maloney. <laughs> first of all, she's the first woman uh, elected to as prime minister. Um, so again, we'll see what happens in the United States. There may be a similarity there, maybe not. But I, yes, um, you know, whether it's Prime Minister Maloney, whether it's um, uh, the fairly recent elections that took place in France, um, even kind of going back to Brexit, you know, there have been the questions, conversations we're having in the United States about democracy and the health of democracy. Um, these are conversations that are taking place globally. Um, and so I'd encourage you to kind of know that perspective or explore that perspective, be willing to explore that perspective when you're going into these, to these other settings. Um, again, a sense of humility perhaps, but also a sense of real perspective taking um, as you're going into these other countries. The third that I would say sort of came up that we often are telling our students to think about when they're engaging in political conversations here in our classrooms, but that I think will also apply for you, is to engage in active listening. Um, and I've given you a few examples here of things to be thinking about when engaging in active listening. So certainly one way, or the best way, to be able to get that perspective taking, to come in with a sense of humility, is to really actively listen to what you know, the, to the people you are speaking to, whether it's your peers, whether it's faculty members. And I want to encourage you, you know, in your own political conversations, but in these conversations you have abroad, that certainly active listening can involve more than just listening to the words that are coming out of people's mouths, but the tone, the gestures. So being really attentive to the mood, uh, reading a room, sometimes it goes a long way, uh, whether it's in political conversations here or political conversations abroad. Um, things like listening for ideas, what you're hearing from people, not necessarily just what they're saying, but what sort of ideas are they expressing. Um, as was referenced earlier, a lot of the conversations we're having here um, about democracy are, be, are being held in Italy, are being held in France, are being held in the UK, um, and with a lot of support um, towards a particularly right-wing or populist candidacies. Um, you don't know the people you're speaking to where they fall along the ideological spectrum. Don't assume you know where they fall along the ideological perspective or perspective. Um, you may need to just kind of listen and get a sense of what they're saying, the ideas that are being expressed. 
Um, you may want to, again, go back to this idea of not trying to convince, but just trying to learn, to get a better sense of why people are feeling the way they are feeling about politics, here and also abroad. Um, not necessarily making assumptions, jumping you know, five steps ahead based on what you've heard from someone, really just listening to the information that they're sharing with you, not making assumptions about someone. Um, I would say that applies here on this campus too, not necessarily making assumptions you know everything about someone based on their political affiliation or the t-shirt they're wearing or the sticker on their laptop. Um, so these are just a few ideas that I encourage you to think about right now. Um, again, as you're going into the last two weeks of this election campaign here, but as you're preparing to go abroad. Now to sort of solidify these ideas, I have an activity that we're all gonna participate in together. So grab your pen. And I believe, Nicole, do they have the handout on their tables? Okay, you're each gonna get a handout. And once everyone has one, and once you all have a pen, I'm gonna walk you through this activity. And I think it'll be helpful as you're starting to really think about what does it mean to look at things from a different perspective. democracies in general, and they include security, community, prosperity, responsibility, inclusion, equality, tradition, opportunity, justice, freedom, and innovation. So a set of values that are often attached to American democracy or democracies in general. First job or your first task is of that list of values, Think about which ones, which five are the most important to you. And once you've identified which five are most important to you, how would you rank them? What's your most important? What's the second most, third most, fourth most, fifth most? And you're gonna place that in this column here that says rank number one. So for example, if security is the top value for you, it's the value you value most, place a one. A one. So start by identifying which five matter most to you, in what order, and after you've done that, write a really brief definition of those values. So if you've said innovation is your top value, how do you define innovation? So we can give you about five minutes to do this, and then we're going to ask you to share with your table what your five values were and why. For people who are just coming in, we have a list of values. 
going to ask students to identify which are the five most important values to you, to rank them, one to five, in this column here, but then also give a brief definition. If prosperity is number one, how do you conceptualize prosperity? What does prosperity mean to you? Try to finish up maybe in a minute and be ready to talk to your table about it. One more minute. Okay, take a second and pause. At your tables, I want you to share with each other what were your values that you saw as the five most important values? How did you rank them? And I'd like to hear from you afterwards, after you have a minute or two, two or three minutes to have a conversation, hear if there are any themes that emerged from your tables on which values were most important, and did you think of these values differently? Okay, so begin.
minute, and then I'd love to hear what your conversations were all about. Were there some themes that emerged? Okay, I want to hear from some groups about what their conversations were like, were there any themes that emerged about, first of all, which were the most important values and how you thought about these values? Did people think of these values in the same way or did they think of them differently? Anyone want to volunteer or I'll go around and pick people? Anyone, how about at this table? Can you share with me what your conversation was about values, the values that were most important? Um, I think we had like a common theme of like community and equality um, were like big ones for us. And I think in general it was because as a, like obviously you read a lot of these things like um, inclusion and equality as in a community. And I think it's important to be like that welcoming person that's like open to new things. So it's kind of like a big thing that we were talking about. So equality was one of your second. How did you conceive of equality? Um, when we were talking about equality, I think um, something that was like mentioned or just something that like we all had in our head was um, like equal opportunity physically and like mentally and just in like every way and being able to feel this way in um, whatever country you go to and whatever space you find yourself in. Um, and that also like, goes hand in hand with the um, community as well, being able to find your, like a sense of community um, wherever you go. Um, and yeah, to me that was like important, and I feel like that was important to a lot of us, um, especially because of like, yeah, so. I think it's great, and I think you'll probably be having those conversations today. You know, how will you maintain that sense of community um, and protecting your identity when you're away and abroad? So community and equality, did any other groups have different values as some of their top ones? Yeah, this, I'll come here because it's in close. Yes, tell me what was yours? Your groups? Um, well, we all kind of had different ones, but we also came together on like community inclusion and equality. Um, but like, I think we all kind of agree on like community and like leaning on your people, taking like it takes a village, um, and like a sense of belonging. Okay. Anyone else? You said there was a different, did someone have a different one? What's, what was yours over there, one of the top ones? Freedom. Freedom, okay. How did you conceptualize freedom or define it? So we kind of all have different interpretations of freedom, but for me it was free will. Free will? Other people want free will. Yeah. Okay. For me I define freedom as free will. I know for me it was like the choice to choose what path and decisions you get to make. Mine was also along that line of just the freedom of choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't really like come up with a definition. If I can share, like, a sure. Um, I put opportunity and, or like, what I define that as having the ability to pursue anything that you're passionate about um, despite your circumstances. Okay, all right, that's great. Okay, very good. Okay, these are really nice, uh, nice ways to start the conversation about coming to values differently. A um, lot of similarities, but some differences. Okay, let's take this exercise a step further. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to pose a topic, um, and I want you to think about your stance on that topic, and then I want you to think when you were developing your stance on that topic, what, are, what values are driving your stance on that topic? So you've ranked five values right now. Does this ranking change when I bring up a real life situation? And the, the situation I want to bring up is gun control. When you think about things having to do with gun control, your thoughts related to gun control, of those five values, which comes first, which comes second, which comes third, which comes fourth, which comes fifth. So think about your feelings about gun control, how they're informed by your values, and what is the ranking of those values when you're actually applying them to this topic of gun control. Take a minute.
Right. Do, you, do the values that inform your decisions, do they change based on the decision or based on the topic? Second column to rank. What it, how would those five values rank when you're thinking about gun control? that I can help with. So keep those five values. Say that those are still your five most important values. If freedom, for example, was your most important one the first time around, and now you're thinking, how do I feel about gun control? What values are determining your feelings about gun control? Is it still freedom, or is it something else? I do want to hear. Okay, so my question to everyone, now that you have, you know, we were talking in the abstract first time around, now we're talking in relation to an actual topic. Um, and I'd love to know, first of all, did the ranking of value shift? Oh, yeah, it did shift. So my first one used to be community, but then it became security because I feel like the topic of gun control, like, I feel like a lot of people, like, think about, like, freedom first, but I think because of, like, obviously the um, amendment, but uh, I think security is important for me because, granted, like, it is important to have freedom in this country, but some people uh, abuse that, and that is why gun control is such a problem in our country, unfortunately, so I think security means the most to me because we should feel safe wherever we are, if that's Okay, did everyone hear that? I want to make sure everyone's hearing that. So first of all, if freedom, uh, you know, peer of yours has said that originally freedom was the most important value. Um, but when she was actually thinking about gun control, they shifted. And security then became the top value that drove her, dis her feelings about gun control. Anyone else have shifts in their values when they're applying it to gun control? Do you mind? Um, at first, opportunity was another five for me. Um, but as soon as I heard gun control, I thought uh, everybody has, you know, the right to um, the opportunity of life. Um, so it came all the way up to number one for me. Okay, so that you bring up a really good point. So not only did the shifting change, did your conceptualizations or your definitions of these values change when you thought that, about them in the context of gun control? So the opportunity for, for life um, is the way you conceptualized opportunity. Could someone think of opportunity as the opportunity to possess a gun? Could you think, could people be not only having different values driving their decisions, but might they think about these values differently? How about this table, yes? Did anyone have changes, and any changes to definitions too? Oh, so. Sure. I mean, I would say I completely changed everything just because of my view on gun control. Like, I would say security and responsibility are very, very important especially because like people seem to not be one with the blame. They seem to put the blame on one spot when it's like multiple things and it's not just like the laws but also the community and yeah. like the social context. Um, I think there was like some like shifts but there's also like community was still very highly ranked and like that it's important to look after each other and to support mm -hmm. one another and there's like I guess the, the individual rights that people take about it, but then also like you need to think about how this could affect like the community, the people that you're with, and what could happen in these situations. Right. Okay. So good. So the idea of thinking not so much as uh, individually, but as a part of a community, similar to what something I often hear from students when we talk about liberty and gun control. Is it the freedom to own a gun, or is it the freedom to go to a public location and not worry about your safety? Um, the freedom of feeling comfortable in a new situation. 
Um, I think we're, I'm almost out of time. I want to do one more and just see if there's any change of rankings here. And then we'll do a quick reflection. Why did we do this? How might you take some of this? So imagine that the topic now would be access to abortion. So these five values. What's motivating your, would your ranking change? Would your conceptualization of these values change? Anyone's rankings changed? How about over here? Anyone's rankings changed in the values when this is the topic? wants to share, did, their, did the ranking of the values change at all when the topic was access to abortion? Um, for me, freedom was still number one, so I wouldn't really say change. Okay, stay the same. Anyone else? <laughs> Any changes here? Did you change? Uh, yeah. How so? Uh, my first one became freedom this time because abortion is a right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so why did we do this exercise? So first of all, you know, the, the purpose of this exercise is to really think about values in context. In the context here of your peers, but I want to encourage you to think about in the context of a different community. The community you'll be going to, whether it's Italy, Greece, Rome, um, or Italy, Greece, you know, the United States, um, United Kingdom. Um, why, how might this exercise inform you as you're getting ready to go abroad? How might this exercise um, prepare you for being in conversation with others in a different community? I want to ask somebody at this table to tell me. Yeah. I feel like context is more important when it comes to terms of this. Like, if you ask, like, initially without, like, any issues or any topics, we had different rankings, but once you added a topic to it, we had to like change our entire perspective on it. We had a context to refer to, so that was like our guideline, so to speak, and then we had our values ranked accordingly to that. And where are you going, and how might that inform where you're going abroad? Um, planning on going to Switzerland. Okay. Project, I'm waiting for the project information. Okay, so, so imagine how this might affect your preparations and your time in Switzerland. I feel like security is still number one, no matter where I go. Mm -hmm. But in terms of gun control or abortion rights, I feel like that would take a backseat uh, because I don't think it would not it would not it's not prevalent there compared to here. Okay, so help you understand that your values may be very much different yes. differ from people, 100%. right? And not only what they are, but how they conceptualize them. Anyone else on how this might apply as you're getting ready to go abroad? Yes, go ahead and start. So if you value security when you're in America, but then you also value security when you're abroad, it makes your decision making more clear about what the safest decision is to make. So I think it, the more solidified your values are in America, the easier it is for you to figure out what you want your experience to look like abroad because it will also align with your values. Um, okay, so I want to thank you all for participating in the exercise. I hope it at least gives you some things to chew on, to think about as you're getting ready to go abroad. Um, I think, you know, travel is, there's no better education uh, than travel. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, I think at this moment in particular, when not only American democracy is really in flux, but democracies around the globe are really in flux, 
it's a moment to really um, appreciate global citizenship and the role of global citizenship. And it may really play a significant role when you come back to the United States and start to think about what it means to be a democratic citizen here in the United States. So I wish you all the very, very best. I um, congratulate you, wish you safe travels, and um, thank you all for having me.